I used to think Emma and I were unshakable. After 40 years of marriage, we'd seen it all. Raising kids on a tight budget, dealing with my early retirement, and even the highs of welcoming our grandchildren. I believed we'd earned the right to enjoy a quieter life, a life we built together. But lately, it felt like we were living on two different planets. It started when she got that big promotion. I was proud of her. I mean, how could I not be? She worked hard for it. But with the new role came endless late nights and before long, the business trips. At first, they were infrequent. Maybe once a month. She'd pack her bag and promise to call when she landed. I didn't think much of it then. It's work, I told myself. But as the trips became more frequent, her returns home didn't feel like, well, like coming home. She'd look at me, smile, and ask how my day was, but it was like part of her mind was somewhere else entirely. Tonight, she was packing again. I stood in the kitchen nursing a cup of coffee, listening to the sounds of her upstairs, drawers opening and closing, the soft thud of her suitcase wheels on the hardwood floor. She was always quick and methodical when she packed. Her efficiency used to impress me, now it felt distant, like she was preparing for something I wasn't a part of. When she came down, I couldn't help but notice how sharp she looked. She'd always been a beautiful woman, and tonight was no different. She wore a navy blue suit, one that fit her perfectly, and her pearl earrings caught the light. Her hair was styled just so, and the faint scent of her perfume drifted in as she passed me. She had started wearing that perfume recently, a crisp, citrusy one she said a colleague recommended. It wasn't her usual scent, and maybe that's why I noticed it more. You sure you don't want me to drive you to the airport? I asked, trying to sound casual. I leaned against the counter, hoping she'd change her mind. I didn't have a specific reason for wanting to drive her. I just felt like I should be there. No need, she said without looking up, her fingers flying across her phone screen. An Uber's easier. She placed her overnight bag by the door with a practiced ease. It struck me then how often she'd been doing this lately. That bag almost felt like it had a permanent spot near the door. I tried not to think about it too much. I'll call when I land, she added, finally glancing my way. Her tone was light, but it didn't feel reassuring. Her kiss was quick, barely brushing my cheek. It used to linger, even when she was in a rush. This one felt like something on a checklist. Kiss Ethan, grab keys, go. She opened the door without waiting for me to say anything else, and before I knew it, she was stepping into the Uber that had pulled up. I followed her to the doorway and stood there, watching her. The driver, a middle-aged man in a baseball cap, nodded politely at me as Emma climbed into the back seat. She didn't look back. As the car drove off, I stayed there for a while, staring down the empty street. The neighborhood was quiet except for the rustling of leaves in the autumn breeze. I pulled my sweater tighter around me and went back inside, closing the door behind me. The house felt so still, almost hollow. I wandered into the living room, set my coffee cup on the table, and stood there for a moment, looking at the photo of us on the mantel. It was from our 30th anniversary. She was beaming in that photo, her arm around me, the both of us standing on a beach at sunset. I thought about how different she'd been back then, so present, so connected to me. I wondered if it was me who had changed, or if I was just imagining the distance between us now. I tried to shake it off, telling myself I was overthinking things. After all, people grow and change over time. Maybe this was just part of us adjusting to a new chapter. But even as I told myself that, the knot in my chest tightened. Something was wrong. I didn't know what it was yet, but it was there, lurking beneath the surface. The days after Emma left for her trip dragged on. Usually, I'd find comfort in my routine, walking the dog, working on my latest project in the garage, and catching up on my favorite shows in the evening. But this time, everything felt different. I found myself glancing at my phone, waiting for the text she promised when she landed. It didn't come. By the second evening, I gave in and texted her. Did you make it okay? Haven't heard from you. Her reply came quickly. Yes, sorry, been swamped with meetings. Everything's fine. Love you. I stared at the screen, re-reading the message. Nothing about it was unusual, but it didn't sit right with me. Emma wasn't the type to forget little things like checking in. And love you? Sure, we said it often enough, but it felt flat. Like she was ticking a box. 
Maybe it was just me being overly sensitive. I brushed it off. The following morning, I found myself at the coffee shop on Main Street. I'd made a habit of stopping there a couple of times a week since retiring, always grabbing the same thing, a black coffee and a cinnamon roll. A small part of me hoped running into a friendly face might shake the nagging thoughts I couldn't quite put into words. Morning, Ethan, called Janice, the barista who'd been working there for years. She smiled warmly as I walked up to the counter. Usual? Yeah, thanks, I said, trying to sound cheerful. She handed me my coffee and pastry, and as I turned to leave she added, Emma's been a busy bee lately, huh? Haven't seen her in here in ages. Her words stopped me. Emma used to love this place, especially their caramel lattes. She'd always make a point to stop by after her yoga class or before running errands. But Janice was right. It had been a while since Emma's last visit. I didn't know why that detail stuck with me, but it did. Back at home, I settled into my armchair with my coffee, flipping through the local paper. But my mind kept wandering back to Emma. Her trips were getting longer, her texts shorter, and when she was home, she seemed preoccupied, distracted. Conversations with her felt surface level, like we were two strangers making polite small talk instead of a married couple. That afternoon, I decided to give her a call. It rang three times before she picked up. Hey, Ethan, she said, her voice light but a little rushed. Everything okay? Yeah, I just wanted to hear your voice, I said, feeling a little foolish for admitting it. She laughed softly. You're sweet. But I'm in between meetings, so I can't talk long. Sure, I said quickly. How's everything going? Busy, she replied. You wouldn't believe the workload here. I barely have time to breathe. Something in her tone made me pause. It was too rehearsed, too polished. When are you flying back? I asked. Friday, she said, almost too quickly. I'll text you the flight details. The conversation ended shortly after that, leaving me with more questions than answers. I wanted to believe her. God, I wanted to believe her. But the knot in my chest hadn't loosened. If anything, it was tighter now. Later that evening, as I walked through the house, I found myself in our bedroom. Emma's jewelry box sat on the dresser, its lid slightly ajar. She always kept it closed, and I almost reached to shut it, but something stopped me. There, tucked in the corner of the box, was a bracelet I hadn't seen before. A delicate silver piece, simple but elegant, with a small charm dangling from it. When had she gotten this? And why hadn't she mentioned it? I held it in my hand, turning it over, trying to decipher if there was any meaning behind it. Maybe it was nothing, or maybe it was something. I put the bracelet back and closed the lid. Standing there in the dim light of our bedroom, I couldn't shake the feeling that a storm was brewing, one I wasn't ready for. I got to the airport early, wanting to surprise Emma by picking her up. When I saw her coming through the arrivals gate, she looked sharp as always. Polished, professional, but her expression wasn't as warm as I'd hoped. She smiled when she saw me, but it felt forced. You didn't have to come, she said as she gave me a quick hug. Wanted to, I replied, taking her bag. It was light, as usual. Emma had mastered packing for these trips. On the drive home, I asked how the trip went. Exhausting but productive, she said, leaning her head back against the seat. I'm just glad it's over. Did you have any downtime? I asked. Not really, she said after a pause. It was all work. Her answers felt clipped, almost rehearsed, but I didn't push. I told myself I was imagining things, that she was just tired. Still, the knot in my chest tightened. When we got home, Emma went straight to the bedroom, saying she needed to freshen up. While I reheated the stew I'd made, I heard her voice faintly from upstairs. She was on the phone. Her tone was light, almost teasing, followed by a soft laugh. It wasn't the kind of laugh I'd heard in a while, not the tired chuckle she gave me these days. When she came downstairs, I asked, Who were you talking to? Margie from work, she said, almost too quickly. She wanted to go over some notes. I nodded, trying to play it off, but her answer stuck with me. During dinner, she was quiet, scrolling through her phone more than engaging with me. I asked a few questions about her trip, but her answers were short, like she didn't want to talk about it. Later, as we got ready for bed, I finally said, I feel like I barely see you anymore. She sighed, sitting beside me. I know, Ethan. 
It's just the nature of the job. I need you to support me. That's all I need right now. I nodded, forcing a small smile. You have my support. She kissed my hand and turned out the light, falling asleep almost immediately. But I lay there, wide awake, staring at the ceiling. Her words were meant to reassure me, but they didn't. My mind kept circling back to the phone call upstairs, who she was really laughing with and why her stories about these trips seemed so carefully constructed. That night, I realized I wasn't just imagining things. There was a wall between us now, and I wasn't sure if I could tear it down, or if she even wanted me to. The next morning, I woke up to an empty bed. Emma was already downstairs, sipping coffee and scrolling through her phone at the kitchen table. I watched her for a moment from the doorway, her face illuminated by the glow of the screen. She looked calm, focused, like nothing was wrong. But for me, the unease hadn't gone away. Morning, I said, stepping into the kitchen. She glanced up and smiled briefly before going back to her phone. Morning. Coffee's fresh, she replied, nodding toward the pot. I poured myself a cup and sat across from her. What's on the agenda today? I asked, trying to sound casual. Just catching up on some work, she said, gesturing to her laptop on the counter. There's always something to do. It struck me how much time she spent working these days, even when she was supposed to be home and resting. I wanted to ask her if she ever felt burnt out, but I knew how she'd respond. She'd brush it off, say she was fine. That was Emma. After breakfast, she disappeared into the office, leaving me alone with my thoughts. I tried to busy myself in the garage, working on a chair I'd been building for weeks, but my focus kept slipping. I found myself thinking about her phone call the night before, about how distant she'd seemed since she got home. And then there was that bracelet I'd seen in her jewelry box, the one she'd never mentioned. I didn't want to be the kind of husband who snooped. Trust was the foundation of our marriage. Or at least it had been. But as I stood there sanding the edge of the chair, I realized I couldn't let it go. I needed answers. Later that afternoon, while Emma was out running errands, I went upstairs and opened her jewelry box. The bracelet was still there, tucked in the corner. I picked it up, examining it closely. There was a small engraving on the charm, C. That didn't make sense. Who was C? I set the bracelet back where I found it and closed the lid. My hands were trembling. Part of me wanted to confront her right then and there, but another part hesitated. What if I was wrong? What if there was a perfectly innocent explanation? That evening, over dinner, I tried to test the waters. I was looking through some old photos today, I said casually. Came across one from our anniversary trip to the beach. Do you remember that day? Emma smiled faintly. Of course. That was a great trip. Maybe we should plan another getaway soon, I suggested. It's been a while since we've had some time just for us. Her smile faltered for just a second before she nodded. Maybe. Things are just so hectic right now. But I'd love that. When work slows down. Her words sounded right. But her tone didn't. It was too practiced. Like she was trying to placate me. I felt my frustration building. But I swallowed it. This wasn't the time for a fight. After dinner, she retreated to her laptop again. And I went to the living room. Pretending to watch TV. My mind, however, was elsewhere. The bracelet, the phone call, her distant behavior, it all pointed to something I didn't want to admit. But as much as I hated the thought, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Something was wrong, and I needed to find out the truth. The days that followed felt like a balancing act, each one more strained than the last. Emma seemed oblivious to the growing tension, or maybe she was pretending not to notice. I kept up appearances, cooking meals, working on projects, and going through the motions of a normal routine. But inside, the questions gnawed at me. Then, on a quiet Wednesday morning, something happened that made the knot in my chest tighten further. I was in the kitchen cleaning up after breakfast when Emma's phone buzzed on the counter. She was upstairs getting ready, and the screen lit up with a notification. Caleb, can we talk? I froze. Caleb. My mind raced to place the name. He was her boss, the one she'd mentioned now and then in passing always casually, never with much detail. I told myself it was nothing, just a work thing, but the phrasing of the message felt personal, not professional. When Emma came downstairs, she grabbed her phone without a second glance and smiled at me. 
I've got a lot of calls today, she said, her tone breezy. If you need me, just knock on the office door. I nodded, watching her walk away, her phone clutched tightly in her hand. Part of me wanted to ask her outright about the message. But something held me back, the fear of what she might say, or worse, what she wouldn't. That afternoon, I decided to go for a walk. The crisp autumn air helped clear my head, though not enough to stop the thoughts swirling in my mind. Who was Caleb to Emma? Why did his message feel intimate? When I got home, Emma was still in the office, her voice muffled as she spoke on a call. I went about my day, trying to act normal, but the name Caleb lingered in my mind. It was late when she finally emerged, looking tired but content. Tough day? I asked as she sank onto the couch beside me. Always, she replied, giving me a faint smile. But it's worth it. We're making real progress on the project. What kind of project? I asked, trying to keep my tone light. She hesitated, just for a moment, before replying. Oh, just a proposal we're drafting. Nothing exciting. Her answer felt rehearsed, like she'd practiced it. I nodded, pretending to accept it, but inside, my unease grew. Later that night, as we lay in bed, I turned to her. You've been working with Caleb a lot lately, I said, trying to sound casual. She didn't move, but I felt her body stiffen slightly. He's my boss Ethan, she said, her voice carefully measured. We have to work together. I know, I said quickly. I just mean it seems like he's been relying on you a lot. She turned to face me, her expression unreadable. That's what happens when you're good at your job, she said, her tone light but firm. Don't read too much into it. I wanted to push further, but the look in her eyes stopped me. She wasn't just brushing me off, she was warning me. So I let it go, at least for the moment. But as I stared at the ceiling that night, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was slipping through the cracks. Over the next few days, I couldn't stop thinking about Caleb. His name seemed to echo in my mind, taking root in places I didn't want it to. Emma, meanwhile, carried on as if everything was fine. She laughed at the TV shows we watched, asked about my woodworking projects, and even suggested we go out for dinner one night. But it all felt hollow, like she was going through the motions. I started paying closer attention. Not in an obvious way, I didn't want her to think I didn't trust her, but in the quiet moments when she didn't realize I was watching. I noticed how often she glanced at her phone, her face softening at certain messages. I noticed how she'd step out of the room to take calls, her voice dropping to a hushed tone. And I noticed how she'd been spending even more time at work, claiming late nights and extra hours were unavoidable. Then, one evening, she came home later than usual. I was in the kitchen when I heard the door open. She walked in, carrying her bag and looking flustered. Sorry I'm late, she said quickly, not meeting my eyes. The meeting ran long. I nodded, trying to keep my voice steady. Everything okay? Yeah, just busy, she said, brushing past me toward the stairs. I'm going to change real quick. I watched her go, her pace a little too hurried. Something about her energy felt off, like she was nervous or guilty. After a few minutes, I went upstairs to check on her. She was in the bathroom, the door slightly ajar. Her phone was on the bed. Its screen lit up with a notification. Caleb. Missed you today. My heart sank. I stared at the message, a thousand thoughts racing through my mind. Missed you? What did that mean? And why would her boss say something like that? I heard the sound of the faucet turning off and quickly stepped back into the hallway. My hands were trembling as I leaned against the wall, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. When Emma came out a moment later, she smiled at me, her expression casual. But I couldn't meet her eyes. That night, I barely slept. I replayed every moment in my mind, every strange look, every vague answer. I wanted to believe there was an innocent explanation, but deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that I already knew the truth. The next morning, Emma left for work as usual, kissing me on the cheek before heading out the door. As soon as she was gone, I sat down at the kitchen table, my head in my hands. I needed to know what was really going on, no matter how painful it might be. The house felt emptier after Emma left for work that morning. I stood in the kitchen, staring at the cold cup of coffee I'd poured but hadn't touched. Caleb's message from the night before replayed in my head, each word cutting deeper, missed you today. 
I knew I couldn't let it go any longer. Something wasn't adding up, and I needed answers. For the first time in our marriage, I let myself cross a line I never thought I would. I opened Emma's laptop. It was sitting on the counter where she'd left it the night before, still plugged in. My hands hovered over the keyboard as I wrestled with my conscience. We'd built this life together on trust, hadn't we? But if that trust was already broken, didn't I have the right to know? I clicked on her email. It was mostly work-related, endless chains of reports and meeting notes. But then I saw his name, Caleb. My stomach twisted as I clicked the thread. The first few emails seemed innocent enough, updates about projects, scheduling meetings. But then I scrolled further and found a message that made my breath catch. Looking forward to seeing you at the retreat next month. Let's make sure we get some time alone again, again. I stared at the word, my hands shaking. What did he mean by again? My mind raced with possibilities, none of them good. I shut the laptop quickly, as if it might burn me. My heart was pounding, and the room suddenly felt too small. I paced the kitchen, trying to calm myself, but it was no use. I couldn't unsee the message, couldn't unfeel the weight of what it implied. I needed more than an email. I needed the truth, straight from Emma. But how could I confront her without proof? If I came at her now, she'd just deny it, and I'd be left looking paranoid. That afternoon, I made a decision. I hated myself for even considering it, but I couldn't see another way. I called an old friend, Mark, who had worked in private security for years. I told him I needed help, my voice low and strained. He didn't ask questions. He just listened. Ethan, I'll help you, he said after I finished. But you need to be sure about this. Once you go down this road, there's no turning back. I don't think I have a choice, I admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. I need to know. Mark agreed to set things up, a tracker for her car a way to monitor her phone without her knowing. He promised it would be discreet, that Emma wouldn't suspect a thing. But even as I agreed to his plan, a part of me felt like I was betraying her, even if she'd already betrayed me. That night, Emma came home like nothing was wrong. She kissed me on the cheek, asked about my day, and laughed at a joke I made during dinner. For a moment, I almost convinced myself I was overreacting, that maybe I'd gotten it all wrong. But when her phone buzzed later that evening and she quickly turned the screen away, my resolve hardened. Something was happening, and I wasn't going to ignore it any longer. Mark worked quickly. By the end of the week, he'd set everything up. A small tracker discreetly attached to Emma's car and a program installed on her phone. It's nothing invasive, he reassured me over the phone. You'll just get location updates and notifications for specific keywords in her texts or emails. If there's nothing to find, this will prove it. I thanked him, but the knot in my stomach didn't ease. I wasn't sure if I wanted to find anything or if I was more terrified of what I might discover. The first couple of days were quiet. Emma's car went to the office and back, as expected. Her messages were mostly work-related, filled with jargon I barely understood. For a fleeting moment, I thought I might have been wrong. Maybe my suspicions were just that, suspicions. But on the third day, everything changed. It was late in the evening. Emma was upstairs, taking a bath, and I was in the living room, pretending to watch TV. My phone buzzed, a notification from the program Mark had installed. The keyword was, Caleb. I opened the message thread, my breath catching as I read. Looking forward to Friday. Hope we can sneak away like last time. Miss you. I stared at the screen, my hands trembling. Sneak away? Last time, my mind flashed back to the email I'd seen earlier that week, to Caleb's text saying he missed her. It wasn't just a suspicion anymore. It was real. I wanted to march upstairs, confront her, and demand answers. But I stopped myself. Confronting her now would just give her a chance to twist the story, to lie. I needed more. The tracker on her car gave me the next clue. The following afternoon, I checked her location out of curiosity. She told me she was staying late at the office to finish a project. But her car wasn't at her office. It was at a small boutique hotel across town. My chest tightened as I stared at the map, the tiny dot blinking mockingly at me. I grabbed my coat, barely remembering to lock the door behind me as I left the house. I drove in silence, 
my hands gripping the wheel so tightly my knuckles ached. When I pulled into the parking lot of the hotel, I didn't know what I was expecting. Maybe I thought I'd catch her in the act, that I'd finally have undeniable proof. But as I sat there, my heart pounding, I couldn't bring myself to go inside. The thought of seeing her with someone else, it was too much. Instead, I waited. After about an hour, I saw her emerge from the lobby, her hair slightly disheveled and her face flushed. She wasn't alone. Caleb was with her, his hand briefly brushing her arm before she stepped away. They exchanged a few words before she got into her car and drove off. I stayed in my car, staring at the empty spot where they'd been standing. There was no longer any doubt in my mind. Emma was having an affair. When I got home that night, Emma greeted me like everything was normal. She even kissed me on the cheek and asked how my day had been. I played along, but inside, I felt like I was breaking apart. The woman I'd loved for 40 years, the person I'd trusted most in the world, had betrayed me in the worst way. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, I knew I couldn't keep this to myself much longer. The truth was out there now, and it was only a matter of time before everything came crashing down. The next morning, I woke up with a heaviness in my chest I couldn't shake. The image of Emma and Caleb outside the hotel played on a loop in my mind, her flushed face, his casual touch, it was all I could see. I couldn't keep pretending everything was fine. Not anymore. Emma was already downstairs when I walked into the kitchen, humming softly as she poured herself a cup of coffee. She looked so normal, so at ease, like nothing in the world was wrong. It made my stomach churn. Morning, she said brightly, glancing at me over her shoulder. You're up early. Couldn't sleep, I replied, grabbing a mug from the cabinet. My voice sounded steadier than I felt. She turned to face me, her smile faltering slightly. Everything okay? For a moment, I hesitated. I thought about waiting, about gathering even more evidence, but the weight of what I knew was too much to bear. I set my mug down on the counter and looked her in the eyes. Who's Caleb? I asked, my voice quiet but firm. Her reaction was immediate, a slight twitch in her expression, a flicker of panic that she quickly masked. Caleb, she repeated, feigning confusion. He's my boss. I've mentioned him before. You've mentioned him, I said slowly, but you didn't mention spending time with him at a hotel. The color drained from her face. For a second, she didn't move, didn't breathe, and I could see the gears turning in her mind, scrambling for a way out. What are you talking about? she said finally, her voice tight. Don't lie to me, Emma, I said, my tone sharper now. I saw you. Yesterday. At the hotel. Her hand tightened around her coffee mug, and for a moment, I thought she might drop it. Ethan, it's not what you think. Don't, I interrupted, my voice rising. Don't insult me by pretending this is innocent. I know what I saw. I know what's been going on. She opened her mouth to speak but no words came out. Instead, her eyes filled with tears, and she set the mug down on the counter with a shaky hand. It wasn't supposed to happen, she said finally, her voice breaking. I didn't mean for it to go this far. Her words hit me like a punch to the gut. I wanted to yell to demand answers, but all I could do was stare at her, my mind racing with a thousand questions. How long? I asked, my voice trembling. How long has this been going on? She hesitated, wiping at her tears. A few months, she admitted, barely above a whisper. A few months, I repeated, the words bitter on my tongue. You've been lying to me for months. Sneaking around, laughing in my face, pretending everything was fine. It wasn't like that, she said quickly, stepping closer. Ethan, I swear, it didn't mean anything. It was just a mistake. A mistake? I said my voice rising again. You don't accidentally meet someone at a hotel, Emma. This wasn't a one-time thing. She flinched at the anger in my voice, tears streaming down her face now. I know I messed up. I know I hurt you. But I love you, Ethan. I do. I want to fix this. I stared at her, my chest tight with anger and pain. Do you even hear yourself? I asked. You've been having an affair and now you want to pretend like it never happened? Like we can just go back to the way things were? I'll do anything, she said desperately, reaching for my hand. Therapy, counseling, whatever it takes. Please, Ethan, 
Don't give up on us. I pulled my hand away, stepping back. Her words sounded desperate, but there was no remorse in her eyes, only fear. Fear of losing the life we'd built, the stability she'd come to rely on. And in that moment, I realized I didn't know if I could ever trust her again. I need time, I said finally, my voice cold. I need to think. Without waiting for her response, I turned and walked out of the room, the sound of her quiet sobs following me as I left. I spent the rest of the day in the workshop, though I barely touched my tools. The air smelled of sawdust and varnish, normally soothing scents, but today they felt suffocating. My mind was stuck on Emma's words, her tearful admission, her plea to fix what she'd broken. Part of me wanted to believe her, to hope we could piece things back together. But another part knew the damage ran too deep. That night, the house was heavy with silence. Emma kept to herself, staying upstairs while I paced the living room. When I finally went to bed, I found her lying on her side, facing away from me. The faint glow of her phone screen reflected off the wall, but she wasn't scrolling, it looked like she'd been staring at it, unmoving. I didn't say anything. I just climbed into bed, keeping a wide distance between us. Sleep didn't come easily. My mind wandered back through the years, tracing the cracks I hadn't noticed before. Emma's late nights at work, the distracted smiles, the time she'd brushed off my questions with vague answers. How many signs had I missed? How long had she been slipping away from me while I held on to the illusion that everything was fine? The next morning, Emma approached me cautiously, like I was a fragile object she was afraid to break further. She set a cup of coffee in front of me and sat across the table, wringing her hands. I know I don't deserve forgiveness, she began, her voice trembling. But I need you to understand. This wasn't about you. I looked up at her, my chest tightening. Then what was it about, Emma? Because from where I'm sitting, it looks like you threw away forty years for nothing. Her eyes filled with tears again, but this time she didn't cry. She nodded slowly, as if agreeing with my anger. I felt lost, she admitted. After I took the promotion, everything changed. I was working constantly, surrounded by people who made me feel important. Caleb. He noticed me. He made me feel like I mattered in a way I hadn't felt in years. I wanted to shout at her, to tell her that she'd always mattered to me, but the words caught in my throat. Instead, I asked quietly, and I didn't do that for you? Her head snapped up, her face stricken. You did. Ethan, you've always been good to me. This wasn't about you. It was about me. How I felt about myself. Her explanation didn't soothe the pain. If anything, it made it worse. It wasn't that I'd failed her. It was that she'd chosen to seek validation elsewhere. So, what now? I asked, my voice low. You want to pretend this didn't happen? You want me to just forget? No, she said quickly. I don't expect you to forget. I just... I want us to try. I want to rebuild what we've lost. I stared at her, searching her face for something. Remorse, hope, sincerity. I saw all of it, but I also saw fear. Fear that I might not choose to stay. Fear that she'd lose the life she'd built with me. I don't know if I can do this, Emma, I said finally, standing up from the table. I don't know if I can look at you and not see what you've done. Her tears fell silently as she nodded, her hands clutching the edge of the table like it was the only thing keeping her grounded. I understand, she whispered. But please, just think about it. That's all I'm asking. I left the room, her quiet sobs following me. I needed space, time to figure out if there was anything left worth salvaging, or if the life we'd built together was already too broken to fix. The days that followed were some of the hardest I'd ever lived through. The air in the house felt thick, heavy with unspoken words and lingering tension. Emma tried to act normal, cooking meals, straightening up the living room, even asking if I wanted to go on a walk. But I couldn't. I couldn't pretend. Most nights, I retreated to the garage, pretending to work on projects that didn't need doing. Sometimes I'd just sit there, staring at the unfinished chair or an old photo of Emma and me I'd pinned to the wall. It was from our first anniversary trip, her face glowing with a kind of joy that felt a lifetime away now. I kept replaying her words in my mind. This wasn't about you. It echoed like an accusation, even though I knew it wasn't meant to be. But how could I not take it personally? 
40 years of loyalty, love, and shared dreams, and she'd risked it all for a man who made her feel noticed? It felt like a slap to the life we'd built together. On the fourth day, I decided I needed to talk to someone. I couldn't keep this all bottled up, but I didn't want to involve family. Not yet. Instead, I called my oldest friend, Jim. We hadn't seen each other much since I retired, but he'd always been someone I could count on for straight talk. Ethan, it's good to hear from you, Jim said when he answered. How's Emma? How's life? I paused, gripping the phone tighter. Not great, Jim. I need to talk to someone. Can I come by? His tone immediately shifted to concern. Of course. Come over whenever. When I arrived at his house, Jim greeted me with his usual firm handshake, but his eyes were full of questions. We sat on his porch, two mugs of coffee between us, as I told him everything, the late nights, the texts, the hotel, her confession. I expected him to interrupt, to offer advice, but he just listened, his face growing more serious with every word. When I finished, he let out a long breath. Ethan, I don't even know what to say, he admitted. That's a lot. Tell me what to do, I said, my voice cracking slightly. Because right now, I don't know if I can ever trust her again. Jim leaned back in his chair, his gaze thoughtful. Look, I've known you and Emma for decades. You've got something most people would kill for. But trust. That's the foundation, man. If you don't have it, what's left? I nodded slowly, his words hitting me hard. So what? I just walk away? Throw away forty years? No, Jim said firmly. You don't throw anything away. You take your time. Figure out what you want, not just what you're angry about. If there's a way back from this, you'll find it. But if there isn't, don't let guilt keep you in something that's already broken. I sat there, staring at the horizon as his words sank in. He was right. This wasn't a decision I could rush. I needed to think to figure out what I wanted, not just what Emma wanted. When I got home that evening, Emma was waiting in the kitchen. She looked nervous, her hands twisting a dish towel as she stood by the counter. Where were you? she asked, her voice careful. Talking to Jim, I said simply. Her shoulders sagged slightly, like she'd been expecting something worse. Did you? Tell him? I needed someone to talk to, I replied, my tone neutral. I can't carry this alone. She nodded, her eyes dropping to the floor. I get it. I do. For the first time in days, I felt a flicker of something. Relief, maybe? She wasn't trying to fight me on this. She wasn't trying to control how I processed what she'd done. It didn't make the pain go away, but it was a start. That night, I didn't retreat to the garage. I sat in the living room, staring at the old photo albums Emma had left on the coffee table, a subtle invitation I hadn't noticed until now. The memories inside were bittersweet, each one a reminder of what we'd built and what we stood to lose. The next morning, the air in the house was different. Not lighter exactly, but less suffocating. Emma and I hadn't spoken much the night before, but something about the way she left those photo albums on the coffee table stayed with me. It was a small gesture, but it felt like an attempt, a quiet reminder of everything we'd shared. I stayed in bed longer than usual, staring at the ceiling as the morning sunlight crept across the room. For the first time in days, I let myself wonder if there was still something left to save. Could we rebuild trust after something like this? Did I even want to try? By the time I went downstairs, Emma was already in the kitchen, flipping through the newspaper. She looked up when I entered, her expression cautious. Good morning, she said softly. Morning, I replied, grabbing a mug and pouring myself some coffee. The silence between us felt different this time. Not as heavy, almost, expectant. Emma broke it first. I was thinking, she began, her voice careful, that maybe we could go for a walk today. Clear our heads. I glanced at her, surprised. She'd always loved our walks through the park, but we hadn't gone together in weeks. Yeah, I said after a moment. That might be nice. We set out after lunch, the crisp autumn air carrying the scent of fallen leaves. The park was quiet, just a few joggers and families with strollers passing by. We walked side by side, the silence between us punctuated by the crunch of leaves underfoot. I miss this, Emma said suddenly, her voice barely above a whisper. I looked at her, waiting for her to continue. Us, she said, 
glancing at me with tear-filled eyes. Before everything got so complicated, I stopped walking, turning to face her. Then why did you do it, Emma? Why risk everything we've built? Her shoulders sagged, and she looked down at the ground. I don't have a good answer, she admitted. I felt invisible, like I was just coasting through life, and Caleb made me feel, she stopped, shaking her head. I don't want to make excuses. I made a terrible choice, and I'll regret it for the rest of my life. I studied her face, searching for any sign of insincerity. All I saw was pain and regret, raw and unguarded. I don't know if I can forgive you, I said quietly. I don't know if I can ever look at you the same way again. Her tears spilled over, and she nodded. I understand. But I'm willing to do whatever it takes to prove to you that I still love you, Ethan. That I want to make this right, even if it takes the rest of my life. We stood there for a long moment, the world around us seeming to pause. For the first time, I felt a flicker of something I hadn't felt in days. Hope. It was faint, fragile, but it was there. I don't know what the future looks like, I said finally. But if we're going to try, it has to be different. No more lies. No more secrets. Agreed, she said, her voice steady despite the tears. I'll do anything to fix this. I nodded, unsure if I believed her yet but willing to take the first step. We started walking again, the silence between us less heavy, like the weight of what had happened was beginning to lift. Just a little. The weeks after Emma's resignation passed in a strange limbo. We were trying, both of us, but the weight of what had happened lingered in every interaction. Some days felt easier than others, like when we laughed at a memory during therapy or sat in silence watching a movie, just grateful for the shared space. Other days were heavy, full of awkward silences or moments when I'd catch myself wondering if I could ever truly forgive her. Emma was determined, though. She poured herself into rebuilding our relationship, even in the small, day-to-day -day moments. She'd leave sticky notes with kind messages on my coffee mug or my workbench, make an effort to sit with me in the evenings instead of retreating to her own space, and ask about things she used to ignore, like my woodworking projects. Her gestures felt genuine, but trust didn't come easily, not after the betrayal we'd endured. One evening, Emma suggested we visit Lila, our daughter, and her family. It's been a while since we've seen the kids, she said, her voice hesitant. I think it'd be good for us, a reminder of everything we've built. At first, I wasn't sure. Showing up at Lila's home, playing the role of the United Grandparents, felt like a lie. But something in Emma's eyes, the way she seemed to need this, made me agree. When we arrived, the grandkids rushed to greet us, their squeals of joy cutting through the tension I'd been carrying. They threw themselves into our arms, their little hands tugging at mine as they chattered about their latest adventures. For the first time in what felt like ages, I felt a genuine smile tugging at my lips. Emma, too, seemed lighter. She laughed with them, chasing them through the yard and helping them set up a tea party with stuffed animals. Watching her, I was struck by how natural she looked. How happy. For a moment, I saw the Emma I fell in love with all those years ago, the one who could light up a room with her laughter. As the evening wore on, I found myself softening, though I wasn't sure if it was because of her or because of the joy the kids brought. While Emma cradled the baby in her arms, singing softly to lull him to sleep, I couldn't help but feel a pang in my chest. This was the woman I'd built a life with, the mother of my children, the grandmother of these little ones. That connection, the foundation of everything we'd shared, was still there, even under all the hurt. On the drive home, Emma was quiet at first, her hands resting in her lap. Then, as we turned onto a quieter road, she reached out and placed her hand on mine. Her touch was light, hesitant, as if she expected me to pull away. I froze for a moment, unsure of what to do. The memory of her betrayal was still fresh, still raw, but so was the memory of her laughter with the kids, the softness in her eyes when she held the baby. Slowly, I let her take my hand. Her fingers tightened around mine, and I could feel the relief in her grip. She didn't say anything, and neither did I. The silence between us felt different this time, not as heavy, almost peaceful. That night, after we got home, I lay in bed replaying the evening in my mind. Seeing Emma with the grandkids had reminded me of the life we'd built together, of the love that had carried us through decades of ups and downs. It wasn't forgiveness. Not yet. But it was the first time I felt like maybe, just maybe, 
there was something worth fighting for. The day after visiting Lila's family, I woke up feeling, different. Lighter, maybe. Four weeks, the weight of Emma's betrayal had pressed down on me, a constant reminder of what we'd lost. But after seeing her with the grandkids, after holding her hand on the drive home, I realized something. The love I'd buried beneath the anger and pain hadn't disappeared completely. It was fragile, like an ember in the ashes of a fire, but it was still there. Emma must have noticed the shift too. That morning, she greeted me in the kitchen with a cautious smile, the kind that felt unsure but hopeful. Coffee, she asked, already reaching for my mug. Sure, I said, leaning against the counter. For the first time in a long while, I didn't feel the urge to retreat or shut her out. We sat at the table in silence, the only sounds the faint hum of the refrigerator and the clink of our spoons against the mugs. After a few minutes, Emma broke the quiet. I was thinking, she began carefully, maybe we could take a drive this weekend. Go to the lake? It's been years since we've been there. The lake. It had been one of our favorite places back when the kids were young. We used to spend entire days there fishing, swimming, or just sitting on the shore watching the ripples on the water. The thought of revisiting it felt both comforting and daunting. Maybe, I said cautiously. Let's see how the week goes. Emma nodded, her face brightening slightly. I could see how much she wanted this. Wanted us. The rest of the week passed quietly. Emma kept making an effort, both in therapy and at home. She didn't push too hard didn't demand more from me than I was ready to give. And, slowly, I found myself responding, not fully, but enough to notice the change. By Saturday, I agreed to the drive. As we packed a cooler with snacks and drinks, Emma's excitement was almost contagious. She hummed softly as she moved through the kitchen, her steps lighter than they'd been in months. The drive to the lake was peaceful. We talked about the kids, the grandkids, and even a little about therapy. It was the kind of conversation that felt normal, like the old days before everything fell apart. When we arrived, the lake was as beautiful as I remembered. The water glistened under the afternoon sun, and a gentle breeze carried the scent of pine. Emma spread out a blanket on the grass, and we sat side by side, watching the water. This feels nice, she said softly, breaking the silence. It does, I admitted, surprising myself. We stayed for hours talking about nothing and everything. At one point, Emma reached over and rested her hand on mine, a simple gesture that felt more meaningful than any word she could have said. I didn't pull away. By the time we packed up and headed home, I felt something I hadn't felt in months. Peace. It wasn't forgiveness, not yet, but it was a start. For the first time, I allowed myself to believe that maybe, just maybe, we could build something new from the ruins of what we'd lost. Let me know if this works or if you'd like adjustments. The weeks that followed our trip to the lake felt like cautiously stepping onto thin ice. There were moments where things felt lighter, almost normal, like when we laughed at a silly show or shared a quiet evening flipping through old photo albums. But the weight of what had happened never truly disappeared. It lingered, waiting for the right moment to remind me that forgiveness wasn't something I could summon on demand. Emma continued to put in the effort, and I could see how hard she was trying. She stayed consistent, showing up for therapy without fail, listening more than speaking, and making an effort to check in with me in small but meaningful ways. I caught her one evening, her hands trembling slightly as she made a grocery list. I knew it wasn't about the list, it was the weight of trying to rebuild something when you're not sure if the other person is all the way in. On a quiet Thursday evening, Emma broke the silence as we sat on the porch watching the sun dip below the horizon. Do you think we'll ever be the same? She asked softly her voice barely above a whisper. The question caught me off guard, though I suppose I'd been asking myself the same thing for weeks. I stared out at the yard, watching the shadows lengthen as the day faded. No, I said finally. We won't be the same. Too much has happened for that. Her face fell, and for a moment, I thought I'd said too much. But then I added, but maybe that's not a bad thing. Her gaze snapped back to me, searching my face for some clue as to what I meant. What do you mean? she asked cautiously. I sighed, resting my hands on my knees. The trust we had, it's gone, Emma. That's the truth. But maybe we can build something different. Something stronger, if we're willing to do the work. Her eyes filled with tears, and she reached for my hand. I'll do the work, she said firmly. Whatever it takes. For as long as it takes. 
Her words felt sincere, but trust wasn't something I could just give back. It would take time, and even then, I wasn't sure if it would ever be whole again. But in that moment, I felt a flicker of something. Hope, maybe. Or at least the willingness to try. That night, as we lay in bed, I noticed the quiet had changed. It wasn't the strained silence of two people avoiding each other, but something closer to peace. For the first time in a long while, I felt like we were moving forward. Not as the couple we used to be, but as something new. Something that might, one day, feel whole again. Let me know if you're ready for more or need adjustments.